Well, no, wait, the line is get in, loser. That's it. Get in, loser, we're going podcasting. <laughs> this is acceptable vices for June. June. This is acceptable <laughs> vices. <laughs> I love when you, like, get into your radio voice. I know. <laughs> <laughs> This is Acceptable Vices for July 22nd, 2016. Tonight, alcohol. Hey everyone, this is Acceptable Vices. I'm your happy host, Victor Frost. Tonight, we are perhaps, for the first time, going to talk about what society would generally refer to as a vice, alcohol. On the show tonight, we've got a bevy of experts... First up on the lineup, we've got George. Hey, George. Evening, everybody. How's it going? Not bad. It is entirely too hot this weekend, oh. but we have central air, so don't, it's all good. Don't even don't even go there about the heat. It's 106 out there right now. It's gonna Goodness. be 100. It's gonna be 97 and humid here all Blech. weekend. Yeah. We're not going to do it. (laughs) Ah, From uh, New York, New York, we've got Nelson, who's who's ate something, I suppose. Yeah, I just indulged in a a vice of my own, which is uh, French fries. Ah, French fries. Uh, Curly fries or regular fries? Uh, Thick. The thick fries. I don't know what the steak fries, I think, are called. Steak fries. I think steak fries is uh, is a thing. We should make steak fries this weekend. Yeah. They're just called chips, you maniacs. Yeah. <laughs> some, some good old English French chips. Yes. <laughs> uh, spewing chunder from the land down under, we've got Cherba. Hey, I've not broken my streak in quite some time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you've, got a, uh, you've got a rather dapper dude, Cherbs. You've got a haircut. Yeah, that's why the show's so late this morning, because I'm sitting in the barber's chair, like, just kind of sneaking my hand up from under the fucking gown, just to look at being like, to my fucking barber, like, yeah, sorry, man, hold on a sec, I just got a message from my co-host. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you're listening to the show and you want to see Cherba's dapper do, it actually it is actually a really good haircut. Uh, more of a reason to check out the video stream, apart from the fact that the video actually goes up on the day the podcast is supposed to. <laughs> I uh, love that. <laughs> and the reason George is on the couch tonight, it's Christina. Hello. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me tonight. Ah, thank oh. you for coming on. Uh, do, you, do you prefer Christina or Chris? Because George says Chris. Or, and, and yeah, I usually go by Chris. All right, Chris. Chris is uh, Chris is George's significant other, his uh, constant companion in both booze and residence. So... Uh, and cars. We got the, huh? And cars. And cars. <laughs> and cars. <laughs> so we've got a good array of people who, uh, in some form or another, have some expertise or experience in the world of alcohol. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us begin. Tonight is the alcohol fest. So, first well, and course. foremost, uh, well, first I'd like and to go. Foremost, what are you all what? drinking? <laughs> I am drinking uh, some iced tea uh, because I did not want to dip into the Johnny Walker gold we have, which is presently one of the only bottles of alcohol we have. Gold. Mm. Yeah, that's probably <laughs> a waste. Yeah, it does not. It does. To me, my my dad swears he can tell the difference, but to me, I can't tell the difference between Johnny Walker Gold and Johnny Walker Red. So, eh. Trust me, you're not the only one. Like the difference between most of the Johnny Walkers is largely academic. There is a tasteable difference between regular Johnny Walkers and Blue Label. But to let's be honest, ninety percent of the difference between regular Johnny Walker and Blue Label is about a hundred and fifty dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Which I suppose comes to one of the first of I'm sure many tips we're gonna give our, our happy audience during the course of this show. You don't have to buy the really expensive stuff to enjoy it. In fact, most people, even really high end wine critics, have been in double-blind studies shown to not be able to tell the difference between cheap crap 
uh, wine or alcohol and the super expensive stuff. I remember that, but there was a caveat to that study, and that was those were the first year sommelier... How do you say it? Sommelier. Sommeliers. Sommeliers. Those were the first year sommeliers. Yeah. They, they were yes, the, the, the students. The first year Somalians. <laughs> Somalia? Uh, I don't know. Anyways, so th those are basically the scrubs. They didn't. They weren't actually like finished yet. Ah, uh, they were the fresh meat, huh? Yeah. Mm. Some, el, yeah. Some, el, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyways, Somalia. they were ba basically the 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 study. The thing was to demonstrate to them how much they had to learn because they <laughs> were dumb. So it was the first year ass whooping, huh? Yeah. Exactly. It was the hazing. The hazing. <laughs> uh, but Sorry. I think, I mean, even, even okay, maybe even if not the, the, the super high-end some... Really? Sherbo, one more time for us, please. <laughs> sommelier. Sommelier. Even among them, um, them aside, rather... The average consumer of uh, of alcohol is gonna have a hard time telling the difference. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Your average person just you know don't worry about price. Just fucking drink what you like. So. Exactly. If you, you like, if you would favorite? rather drink down a ball of Manischewitz, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> so is that oh, just Jesus. it? Are we done for the night? You know, just <laughs> roll credits. Well, no, because because <laughs> among the, I mean, of course drink what you like, but among what's available, there are differences in taste. I mean, you're going to have... You want to drink a nice chocolate lager, that's going to be a lot different than if you want than if you want a, a pale ale or a cider. So while we're, while we're discussing the, the differences in here, why don't we go around and uh, give our, our alcohols of choice. Uh, Nelson, why don't you go ahead? What, what's, your, what's, your, what's your booze of preference? Um... In terms of what I enjoy the most, I'm not sure, because my tastes change with the winds. Um, but in terms of what I probably drink the most, uh, I would have to say it's most likely uh, Old Over Overholt whiskey. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Omegang beer, because Omegang is local, is a relatively local brewery, and they are quite good. Um, they are considered a fancy beer in most parts of the country, but because they're local, I get um, like a six pack of just whatever is in season, and it's fantastic. Cool, uh, George. What's your uh, what's your go-to alcoholic um, beverage? For me, probably a uh, lager of some kind. My favorite beer. Well, for one, it's beer is my go-to. Two, my favorite beer is when all the Oktoberfests are in season. Ooh. I love that, you know, <laughs> really smooth, not super hoppy beer. That That's my favorite. Uh, tonight I'm drinking gin with bitter lemon, and cool. it's delicious. A simple yet delicious drink. With a pinky up, I saw that. With the pinky up, he's he's got to be. I thought I be, snuck it off the, the screen. <laughs> nope. Chris, what about you? Well, I am drinking the same thing George made too for us, um, but normally I am a beer drinker. Beers oh, yeah. of all shapes and sizes. I tend towards ales. The lagers are more George's jam. Yeah, I must say that is a familiar mattress in the background of your shot there, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a thing. Chris has taken over George's uh, regular um, studio with yeah, studio he's... in massive air quotes. Um, he's sequestered to the couch tonight yes. so that I could join in. He's on I a big old... George lost. <laughs> <laughs> he got better, and sure... obviously. <laughs> Jerbo, what, uh, what's, your, what's your beverage of choice? Uh, at the moment, it is test tea, which I pretty much grabbed because of the name. No, it's literally <laughs> of called Bucky's Test Tea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Because but you're yes. a super giant man children. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but yes, it is test tea, unsweetened rose green tea mm. with a double of vodka. 
Uh, this was the for, pretty much the only mixer I had in the house, so I'm actually quite liking it. It's quite nice, to be honest. Like the yeah. fucking the floweriness kind of takes the bite out of the vodka just enough to make it pleasant. Yeah, mm. I I'm surprised there aren't more mixed drinks with teas. Yeah, it's a bit of well, a because it's there's a lot of good variety there, and there's a lot of interesting flavors that can kind of mellow out a lot of other things. I wonder if anybody's ever tried a uh, a matcha vodka mix. I haven't, because I've never had matcha. But ah. anyway, it, it really matcha depends. Matcha tastes yeah. a bit like, you know, wet grass and camel spit. I don't oh, matcha is delicious. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a minute, how do you know what camel spit tastes like? I'm guessing. I'm venturing <laughs> out on a limb here. I would think of all the things, yeah. That's the only thing it could possibly taste like. I'm not a fan, obviously. <laughs> For me, my um, my alcohol of choice. I'm not really big on on beers or hard liquor, though. There are there are times where I'll enjoy both. But me, I definitely uh, hang more on uh, ciders. So mm -hmm. my my go-to drink would be a uh, either a uh, woodchuck cider, where you can get them in those wonderful 16 packs, get a good variety of them, or uh, a Wider's Dry Pear Cider, which is really crisp and refreshing. Pear Cider is interesting. I'm not sure how I feel about it yet, but I've tried a few different ones, and it's it's definitely a unique flavor. The Dry Pear or the Dry Raspberry are, are I think, their two best varieties for Wider's. Yeah. We have a cidery here in Virginia. It's uh, not too far from here. I don't know how long it's been in business, but we just started seeing it on shelves recently. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, um, what was that, Bold Rock. Bold and they Rock, do a yeah. handful of different ciders, which are fantastic. I'm not normally a cider drinker, but these are nice and uh, they're, they're not dry, a little bit tart. I mean, they're not mm -hmm. sweet, but a little bit tart. Yeah, I like the dry. peach one a lot. My, the what? Uh, I mean the pear. Ah uh, yes, I mean the pear. They don't make a peach one. <laughs> My stepdad actually started making cider. I think two years ago. They live up in the Catskills, huh? um, so of course they make cider and have <laughs> maple trees and have chickens. Um, <clears throat> but the cider that he makes is different than like a beerish cider. It is more of like a limoncello kind of strong, like, distilled mm. thing. It's very, it's interesting. Mm. It's more like an after-dinner kind of uh, digestif. Uh, uh. Hmm. So, among... <laughs> <laughs> you, haven't you missed one? <laughs> what? But no, to me, that's not really fair, because my, I don't really have a favorite tipple way back when I was but a wee neophyte behind the bar. Fucking going back a few years now. But uh, the guy who taught me basically everything there is to know about bars, Pete Hawthorne, he was basically like, oh, do you have a favorite drink? I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I like a bit of rum, I like a bit of beer. And he's like, not anymore, you don't. You drink everything. You can't be a bartender <laughs> if you don't drink everything. Because <laughs> you don't know your product. So now, yep. Yeah, Pretty much, I'll drink anything. Rum, fucking, it's all good. Scrumpy is a favorite. That's always nice. All night to drink scrumpy. <laughs> Sorry. Go to West Country. There is awesome. a... Well, I mean, the, the interesting thing about alcohol is that there is a fair amount of cultural weight behind it. I mean, different sorts of people are supposed to drink different sorts of things. Um, when pressed... If I'm at a bar and they don't have ciders, I'll like naturally gravitate towards what might typically be called a uh, a, a chick drink, you know, like a fruity, over-flavored cocktail. So, um, so have you guys ever encountered any sort of stereotyping at bars or anything like that? You know, when you go and you know to get a drink. Uh, when I was younger. <laughs> Was, your, was the stereotype when you were younger them refusing to serve you? Oh, no. <laughs> quite the contrary, actually. Um, so I, I used to wear suits all the time. I still wear them most of the 
uh, not most of the time, but when I when it's cool enough out. Mm -hmm. um, but every time I would go out drinking before when I was underage, uh, I would just wear a suit because that's the thing I wore out and about. Um, mm -hmm. And it was very strange. Like, I don't think I experienced the, I don't know, like the anxiety of trying to get a drink when you're underage, that, mm -hmm. that cool, like, atmosphere. Um, because I would go up to the bar and order a drink and just, you know, get a drink. And then I would be like, oh, friends, do you want a drink? And they would be like, oh, can I? Like, I'm like, if, not if you're acting like that. <laughs> Play <laughs> cool, guys. Jeez. Yeah. Uh, I've um, I've never been carded in my life, <laughs> which which was a source of much anxiety for me when I was younger. And I was like, now wait a minute, shouldn't you be carding me or something? I don't look that old, do I? <laughs> well, but so so I think the. Uh, going, coming back to the drink, like, tropes, um, I think I definitely used to, like, veer towards more classic drinks, um, just because of the whole aesthetic, like, oh, I'm wearing a suit, I'm wearing a, you know, a hat, I should order a martini. Whiskey sour. Like, An old-fashioned... I love old fashions. That's a little bit too on the nose there, George. <laughs> Man, old fashioned um, face. <laughs> one time, actually, there's a bar up the street from my apartment that's kind of fancy. Um, and I went there on a hot day with uh, Charlotte, and I wanted a mint julep because it was a really hot day, and I was like, ah, oh, you know what would be super refreshing? A mint julep. And the bartender went behind the counter and, like, you know, rummaged around for, like, a few minutes, and he <laughs> brought out this antique, um, like, ice crusher thing. Oh, no. <laughs> I was just like, you know, just, like, crush the ice, whatever. But, but he was, like, grinding up the ice and then, you know, doing it the real way. I was like, oh, this is your, like, this is your specialty, isn't it? Serious <laughs> business. You're the mint julep guy. Uh, it was quite good. Wow, uh, he's better than me. I used to like just get ice and a cl and like I had a bar towel specifically for smashing ice. Just <laughs> ice in the bar towel, wrap it, give it a spin, and beat the shit out of it on the counter. There's a <laughs> apparently there's a special type of long, heavy spoon that's really good for uh, crushing ice. Huh? It's specifically I forgot what it's called, but uh, I know my mom actually has one, and it's a like the head is a lot heavier than a normal spoon of that like size. And you just crack the ice and it works perfectly. It's really nice. Oh, fascinating. Apparently you can get like uh, bar spoons with that kind of heavy head on them. I've never seen that before. It's good for oh. whacking drunks. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I have a UB behind the bar for specifically that purpose. Because ah. <laughs> if you try and cross the bar, old UB comes out and UB fucked. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, but I, 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 I want to know this, and you, you probably know this better than any of us. Um, a lot of people say that, okay, yeah, you want ice that's frozen super quick so it gets really clear, and you know, does does the does how fast the ice is is made into ice matter for drinks? Like, is there kinds of ice that you want to use for different drinks apart from like you know shredded or you know? Big solid cubes, or, or like, how does ice play into drinks if it if it does at all? Well, there's a lot of different ways that ice plays into drinks. It can be just for cooling. It can be to provide extra aeration when you're shaking. Uh, it can be to water the drink down slowly so the taste changes over time. There's a lot of different mm. reasons to put ice in a drink, but. Mm. The specific type of ice and how fast it's frozen and things like that, most of the time doesn't really matter enough to make a difference. Like, the biggest factor is that, like, when you're shaking, you want small cube ice, like the kind that comes out of an ice maker, funnily enough. Uh, often with a small dish in the bottom, which is also pretty good for that. Uh, and when you are having a drink on the rocks, like, especially a neat spirit, then you want the biggest lumps of ice you can, preferably ball-shaped, like big balls of fucking ice. 
Ah, the ones balls. that you need the, the ones that you need that special press to make it into that nice perfect sphere. Uh, I mean, yeah. you don't you don't need you the don't press need for the it. sphere, but it makes it clear. <laughs> uh, and I forgot exactly how that works, but I believe it is uh, it uh, kind of it it brings the air to one side of it and then you chop it off, right? Something like that? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. So what's like, the purpose basically, of the ball shape? Uh, the ball around. shape provides a nice surface so. area and also allows it to turn freely so that uh, like when you move the glass, one side of it is not always in contact because it doesn't flatten out. Hmm. And the broader surface area cools the drink more efficiently while transferring less heat into the ice to melt it. Oh. So that's the kind of what that's the one you would use um is that the kind of the shape of ice that you would use to slowly water a drink down over time like you said? Uh no, you just use regular ice for that because ah. it actually melts too slowly for that. Oh. So but, you wouldn't so, use yeah, that for uh, example with a um with a um God, what's it called a uh, a water whiskey mix. Uh whiskey and water? Whiskey and no, water. Probably yeah. not. No, if you're just doing it with whiskey and water you wouldn't like whiskey and water, you just put a splash of water in. You don't bother mm. to wait for the ice to do it for you. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be there all you fucking night. Scotch on the drink. rocks. You'd want a big ball of ice. Yes, scotch mm. on the rocks, whiskey on the rocks. Or scotch on the, on the rock, as it were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh. And there's also uh, a couple of drinks that people have come up with lately which are actually inside of a sphere of ice. And you've got mm. one ingredient inside of a sphere of ice and that's hollow on the inside. Right. And then you've got another ingredient surrounding it and it comes with this tiny little hammer. And you break the ice ball with the hammer and then give the glass a spin and it all mixes. And that is a pretty cool way to serve a cocktail, though it is way too time intensive. <laughs> that is so far <laughs> up its own ass, it's right. ridiculous. It's one of those things you'd serve in a really high-class place where people are paying a lot of money for drinks and don't mind waiting, but in your yeah. average bar, no, fucking way too expensive. Yeah. Uh, what about bar? Ex what about the bars themselves? I mean, there's a lot of... Um, when I was first taking some friends out for drinks and stuff, there was... Some of my friends had anxieties about, you know, what kind of bars they would go to, and while others had very clear preferences of what kind of places they liked... What do you think, what kind of bar presents, like, the smallest barrier to entry in terms of um, personal anxiety among patrons? Well, that's pretty easy. Your local RSL. What the hell's an RSL? Else knows what the fuck that is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Return Servicemen's League, or there's also sporting clubs and workers' clubs. Mm -hmm. They're basically, like... Um, I'm trying to think of it, what the American equivalent would be, but it's kind of like uh, just kind of an average restaurant, you know, steaks and schnitzels and regular stuff. Oh, well, you mean like a, like, like a, a bar small... and grill? Yeah, it's basically like just a very simple bar and grill with like a small area where they'll sometimes have entertainment, usually some poker machines sitting around. Hmm, poker Things machines. Things like that, yeah. Oh, wait, that's not a big thing in the States to just have poker machines fucking everywhere. <laughs> no, no. I mean, if it's any sort of gambling, it's um, it's the lottery where you can go and do uh, put in oh, your Kino. numbers. But Kino, yeah. If, if, yeah. if at all, really. Marking off the uh, boxes 1 to 100, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fun facts, I also used to have my gambling license as well as my fucking RSL. <laughs> oh. so. Many things I know. <laughs> I'm a, I'm a hospitality fucking monster. <laughs> so, in New York City, I would classify uh, different levels of bar into mm -hmm. a few different classifications. And let me know if these classifications are the same in other places. Um, so at the lowest level, there's the dive bar. And sometimes it's a biker bar, and sometimes it's... Uh, you know, just like a regular neighborhood dive bar. Mm. Um, right above that is, I don't know if this exists in other places, but the dog dive bar, where people bring their dogs, because that is the dive bar where you can bring your dog and hang out with dogs. <laughs> um, I, I have no uh, doubt such a thing exists here in California, but I've not seen one. That's not a thing dog. I've ever seen. Really? They yeah. are... 
literally every neighborhood in Brooklyn has at least one <laughs> dive bar where people bring their dogs. That sounds excellent. It's it really does. great. Um, then there's the pub, which is sort of like maybe you get some food, maybe you get some drinks, you know, bar bar food. Uh, and then there is the bistro pub, which really just means Ooh. it's a slightly more expensive pub. Right. Um, then we have the cocktail bar, which is usually a... But Nelson, what about the gastro pub? Gastro pub and bistro pub are basically... <laughs> They're basically the same thing. They're yeah. both basically just a pub with food and pretensions of grandeur. Yeah. <laughs> um, cocktail bars might be like cozy places, like the place up the street from me. Um, they might also be what are known in New York as banker bars, where the mm. bankers hang out. Uh, and those are actually not very good uh, bars, um, partially because of the, the you know, other bar patrons, but mostly because they are extremely overpriced, but not actually very good. Um, so we actually had, in, uh, in Richmond, where I went to college, uh, there was a bar there called The Bank. And it was an old bank that they had converted mm -hmm. into a martini bar, which was actually yeah. pretty excellent. That's and a weird... The, oh, sorry, go on. <laughs> yeah, the basement they turned into a club. It was a separate, you know, entity. They had different events going on, and that was called The Vault. And it was... I never went down there. It was scary foam room, flashy <laughs> lights things going on. <laughs> <laughs> but it was really cool in the bank. Hmm. That is a weird No bankers there, <laughs> interestingly, though. No bankers. Lots of ad in, men. <laughs> in my city, there, there was actually a nightclub called The Bank, which really? was built into an old bank vault. <laughs> 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 and they had the whole same sort of thing going on. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, that's weird coincidence. Huh. It was right across, from, uh, right across from RG's for all those literally no people who know what I'm talking about. <laughs> no. Uh, maybe, Prad, maybe Prad knows what you're talking about. Actually, Prad might, yeah. He might. He's, he's been out in the valley a fair bit. Yeah. Uh, yep. The bank was right say... downtown. It was, a, it was right in the old financial district. So everything else was closed there. There was nothing else in the neighborhood. So if you wanted, like, a snack after your martinis, you were SOL. Mm. But... <laughs> just, what? There's, there's no dodgy kebab shops? No. No, no had to walk half a mile. Station, no believe it or not, Trooper. Station pie? Nothing. There was absolutely nothing. Believe it or not, Trooper, in most places in the United States, most places in the United States do not have a persistence of 24-hour things. Okay, so first you're telling me no democracy sausages. Now you're saying no 2 a.m. dodgy kebabs. I know, and man. You I know. Tell me you live in a civilized fucking country. <laughs> no, well, man. Why, I'm telling you, the only place, to the big cities. The only places around me within like five or ten miles that are open 24 hours is Denny's. Um, <laughs> some. Eh, oh, not, speaking of which. Oh. One of my favorite places to drink in town is this place called Pancake Manor. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Denny's do the Denny's doesn't serve alcohol. Yeah, but Pancake mm. Manor does. <laughs> right, uh, um, one thing that... just don't get fucking rat shit meat pancakes. <laughs> one thing that is uh, unique on the East Coast compared to the West Coast of the mm. United States is the plethora, and I'm not sure if this is just a sort of Northeast thing, well, or if it's actually down in the south. Nelson, but... Nelson, w one more time. You came in like a robot there. I am a robot. Um, <laughs> one of the one of the things that's unique on the East Coast, um, is, I mean, there's a few of them on the West Coast, mm -hmm. but 24-hour diners, um, and yeah. a handful yeah. of them. Yeah, it's mostly a New Jersey thing. Yeah, New Jersey, New York. Uh, a little bit in New England. Um, is it not? Do they not really have those in the South? Uh, we got a couple no, of those don't. here and there. We've got one in the small town where I work, uh, and it's dodgy as hell. It's been there for decades. <laughs> um, well, the dodgy ones tell, are the, the good ones. Yeah, I hear yeah. tell that it just got a makeover, and everyone's really weirded out by it because we've all been <laughs> used to going into this. 
creepy ass trailer with a long grill, and now there's like TVs and stuff. I haven't mm. been in since they made it over. You've um, made it better, and now it's bad. <laughs> now it's awful. Now no, everyone's paranoid. <laughs> mm. But yeah, we don't have too many of the 24-hour diners around here. Mm. Nelson, yeah. is there anything above the, uh, the the cocktail, the fancy banker bar? Um, sort of. So there is, there's two things above that, uh, at least in price. Um, there is the quote-unquote speakeasy, um, which in some cases is actually like a nice neighborhood cocktail bar. Like there's a place called the Clover Club um, that serves kind of pre-prohibition uh, cocktails. Wasn't but it's that not... the name of that nightclub in The Mask? No. No, no I'm thinking of the... Never mind. <laughs> Um, it's not super expensive, but it's that kind of like, oh, this is the 20s place. Well, we like the 20s. Um, and then there are the ones that are Ooh, actually, actually quite expensive. Uh, and you have to dial a specific number to get in. Um, and you don't, they don't have menus, you just tell them, and this is a real thing, this is not like a, a parody thing. Uh, you have to tell them like, three words that describe what kind of drink you want, uh, and they will make you that drink. Uh, and That's apparently... Like, that sounds like the DRM on old 90s DOS games. You have to know the special codes in the manual to get the game to work. Oh, yeah. Well, you have to know the special codes to get in, and then once you're in, you have to say something like, bitter, angry, uh, lemon. Tango, tango, unchain the hot petunia. Actually, bitter angry lemon sounds like it would be a great drink. <laughs> um, I think if someone took me there, I would probably, like, at the, for the entry number, I'd probably try and type 86753.09, and then when they <laughs> ask for my drink, I'd tell them to suck my dick. Fucking <laughs> hell. I think I'd march what? right out with Cherba too. Fuck this. What wanky bullshit is this? I mean, no offense, <laughs> man, but serious. That's just too much. Um, there is a type of bar that I don't know if this fits into your your the uh, the Pecora's hierarchy of bars, um, but it's the uh, the theme bars. You know, like the like a cowboy like where they do like cowboy bars where they do square dancing and stuff like that. They so come in we actually we, <laughs> we don't have a lot of those in New York, or at least I haven't been to a lot of them. Um, where, where does a sports bar fit on this? A sports bar is like a pub. It's an American pub. Yeah. Mm. Because With, because a pub is where like British people go to watch their sports. So they don't have sports. They have cricket. And 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 football. Um. I guess. <laughs> I guess. Oh shit. No, there is the themed bar that I went to. Oh my god. I, I just had a flashback to it. It was horrible. Um, I went out drinking with a friend, and she was like, let's go to this uh, tiki bar. And I was like, oh, okay, I haven't, I haven't been to a tiki bar in a tiki many bar. years. Yeah, I didn't think that was still a thing. But we went there, and they didn't have a floor. They had sand, and I could not deal what? <laughs> like, I walked in and I just walked out. I was like, there is sand all over the floor. <laughs> Wait, they had uh, sand inside a building? Yes. It like, was like a Brooklyn street, and then you go inside and then it's sand, which for people that are really into that sounds like it would be great. You know, take off your shoes and you're on the beach. But At for me, Florida where King. the sand is literally the worst part of going to the beach... Uh, I cannot uh, deal. It no, is. I, Thank I'd you. Do that. I'd, I'd go there. That sounds brilliant. <laughs> yeah, it's, for people that enjoy it, I'm <laughs> sure it's amazing. And apparently for the drinks are very enjoy good. the beach, yes. Ten out of ten for sticking to the theme, too. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, they, they had the whole... They had the torches, they had the thing. Uh, I think I would have enjoyed it if it wasn't sprung on me. Hmm. Like, I can do a themed situation if... I know ahead of time, like, hey, yeah. this is what you're getting into. Yeah. All right, I'm wearing flip-flops tonight. Got yeah. it. Yeah. 
Um, but if you just say, like, uh, oh, let's try this place. Oh, there's no floor. Okay. <laughs> there's no floor. You've got to cling to the walls with climbing equipment. <laughs> uh, you know what's a weird thing that Cherba might not be familiar with is um, sort of not fake, but uh, maybe not entirely accurate British pubs in America. Oh, no, no, I've seen a few of those. They're, they're something. <laughs> well, well, wait a something. minute. Hold on a second. What do you mean? Like, uh, there's one in Rochester called The Old Toad. Um, that sounds like the name of a British pub. Well, yeah, that's what they want you to think. Yeah. Um, although to be fair, in in the old Toad's defense, the the entire interior was shipped over from England, and they only hire English people to work really? there, which is probably illegal. Yeah, um, sounds a little but, illegal. But it makes me feel better about the the <laughs> authenticity of what they're, what they're sets up the with. atmosphere. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, most of them are just, like, trussed up in a lot of wood and, like, pleather crap yeah. and English flags strung up everywhere and they get slightly too enthusiastic about football <laughs> in a way that English people don't really get. <laughs> I don't actually think yeah. there's an upper limit on how uh, enthusiastic English people get about football, though. I don't know. Oh, I've, no, watched the world, I've watched the World Cup and people... People get pretty enthusiastic. It's, it's not so much a upper limit. It's more that there's like this gap in the middle. It's like they kind of go and they reach a certain level of enthusiasm and they stay there until they win or they lose, one of the two, and then suddenly it jumps from there to let's have a fucking riot. <laughs> it's like a capacitor of enthusiasm. Let's have yeah, it's got to charge up before it releases. Riot. Um, what about, uh... Well, I actually, I got, I got a question. What have you guys, like, experienced as, like, a warning sign for a bad bar? As soon as the bartender is throwing a bottle somewhere behind the bar. Yes. He's tossing it, doing acrobatics, oh. do a 180 and walk out of there. Not, you mean you don't love the whole cocktails and dreams thing? Not even a little bit. <laughs> okay, yeah. Flair yeah. bartending, it has a place. It definitely has a place. And that place is competitions for flair bartending. If you want to fly <laughs> flair bartender at an actual working bar, you're a fucking idiot. <laughs> bartender, not a fucking juggler, not a fucking circus clown. Do your fucking job. <laughs> <laughs> um, neon in any place that is not explicitly a dive bar. Like, if I go into a place and it's like, yep, this is a dive bar, and I see some neon, I'm like, okay, this is acceptable. Exception, uh, cyberpunk-themed nights or themed bars. I have not... I need, oh. to, I need to see if there's a cyberpunk bar near me now. It's not a cyberpunk bar, but there is a bar uh, a ways away in Brooklyn uh, that has a TARDIS inside of it. That The TARDIS Whoa. is actually the place to go to the bathroom. <gasps> There is a cyberpunk bar. We have a little, uh, they call it a nano brewery here in Manassas that opened, when did that open up, George, two years ago? No, longer than that. Uh, their, their name is Bad Wolf, named after Bad Wolf in of Doctor course. Who. And, uh, and their, their toilet door is also painted like a TARDIS. <laughs> it's just painted, nothing fancy or anything like that. But it's a cute little, I mean, it's just a tiny little storefront that they <laughs> turned into their own little bar. It I've never heard of a nano brewery. <laughs> it's just basically dudes who are home brewing, and then they were like, hey, we need somewhere for people to sit down. Yeah, let's no, get a like, storefront. It's like, we need some place to actually brew our beer. Let's get a storefront. <laughs> uh, where are we going to put people? There's actually, a, oh, well, there was a place in town called the Brew House, and they were a little upstairs walk-up bar. And they actually used to have, and they bought the space originally as a place to brew beer to sell to other bars, and then they're like, wait a minute, why don't we just set up a bar? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they put the bar 
inside like the same place that they were brewing the beer. Like they had these massive tanks and fucking everything else just hanging around and bubbling and popping and stinking and doing the usual beer stuff. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was pretty good. Cool. Yep. I think I think one big warning sign for a bar is when you walk in and suddenly everybody turns and looks at the door. Unless it's unless you've walked into Cheers where everybody knows your name. <laughs> <laughs> I've been to that I've been to that location and it is nothing like that completely predictably but it's it's no I watch I, I, I draw off a personal experience when I say when everybody turns and looks at you because I was in LA and I was waiting to meet a friend at their apartment um, and I, I just I see this little place I see this little bar it's nighttime when people go to bars I see this bar somewhere maybe I'll walk in and have a drink I push in the door and then, like, everybody turns and looks. So, at that point, I didn't even hesitate. I did a 180 and walked right out. Uh, oh, you know what my biggest warning sign with bars is? Mm. Loud music. Ah! Because mm. I am an old man. <laughs> if I go to a bar... Well, okay. Actually, no. In almost any situation, unless I am going to go dancing at this place, if the music is loud enough that I can't talk with anyone, mm. I'm just like, nope, not not doing this. That is like all the fucking restaurants and bars around here, and it drives me up the fucking wall. I'd say yes if it's just regular, like, piped-in music. Uh, I'd say... Oh, yeah, no, no, live music's completely different. Live yeah. music is fine. Live, yeah. Yeah. live music, it's got to be loud. So yeah. Yep. Uh, my um, biggest warning sign is if you see, and normally you do have to try and order a drink before this happens, but <laughs> if you see a bartender scooping ice with a glass, fucking don't even 180, like fucking 360 and moonwalk out of that motherfucker. Don't pay for your drink don't, that you've ordered that they scooped with fucking the glass or nothing. Just fucking evacuate immediately. Yeah. Well, what's wrong with scooping the ice with the glass? Well, what do glass and ice have in common? They're both transparent. Precisely. So, if the glass breaks or chips in oh. the ice in the ice well, or if someone else's has at some point in the evening, because mm-hmm. you can bet they're not just doing it with your drink, that means <laughs> that there's tiny shards of ice adhering to uh, tiny shards of glass. Awesome. Sorry, <laughs> adhering to the ice in the <laughs> ice well. And do you know what a piece of broken glass does to your esophagus? Nothing yeah, you want to have happen to you, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. And if they're mm. that lax about food and drink safety, then you don't want them handling your food and drink. Mm. At oh. all, never. That, that's, it's, it's a pretty good warning sign, Matt. I have fucking bollocked bartenders for that. Like, obviously ones that I was working with, not just ones in random bars. <laughs> <laughs> I have been tempted on occasion, but no, I have bollock fucking bartenders that I've been training or I've been working with about that till they sweated fucking spinal fluid. That is the biggest (laughs) no-no. Do not fucking do that. Mm. I'll take you out the back and fucking introduce you to Mr. Hosey. (laughs) Uh, uh, I think um, keeping an eye, the smell of a bar, that's another good warning sign. There's this place near the Denny's that I typically go to. It's called, and I'll, I will give them this: the name of their bar is pretty fucking clever. It's Lee's Number Four Cocktails. So if you ever want to tell anybody where you're going, you say, "Oh yeah, I'm going to Lee's for cocktails." I think that's a fantastic name for a bar. But you walk into that bar, it is. It just smells like, not like. Not like alcohol, but alcohol-laden sweat. That's what it just smells like in there. I walked. I was uh, walked out. I walked out of the bar. I was going to the Denny's because I had to poke my head in there at once just to see what's going on in there. Um, and I went to Denny's and I see some people walk straight from Lee's. This is like at two thirty in the morning. Straight from Lee's into the Denny's. And uh, two girls talking to each other, like, I can't believe we went to that bar. Like, yeah, that's a bar that you go to get date raped at. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes. If you can smell the bar from the outside, probably avoid it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, Unless you're into that sort of thing, I guess. I love, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, like every one of these, every one of these things come well, except for ice and glasses, comes with right. a caveat of like, unless you're into that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh let's see. So, what are you? Um, how much effort? How much effort do you guys put into like learning specific recipes? For drinks. First of all, how many of you guys are, are, are into cocktails? Sure, but you, you've had to learn this stuff, so... <laughs> Actually, I'm terrible at memorizing cocktail recipes. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. We have yeah, technology like, nowadays where you can find any cocktail recipe <laughs> from any era of human history uh, instantly. Well, oh. the problem is knowing a good one. Because yeah, like, like, mm, anyone could tell you how to cook something, but you want to know, you want, you know, Gordon Ramsay's recipe or Alton Brown's recipe. You don't want, you know, my recipe. <laughs> That's the thing. Like, I can tell a good recipe from a bad recipe. I can tell what's going to taste like what. I, I can mix it expertly because I've been doing it for years. I can do it in my sleep. But I can't remember the numbers. The pro Like, off the top of my head, no. No chance of remembering the numbers. Mm. Mm. Yeah, a five to one and vermouth to gin ratio might not be the the recipe you want. <laughs> but Unless it's like you're a, really into that. A margarita, <laughs> like a margarita, can you know live or die on how it's mixed. Hmm. So, so and most people uh, like have no idea how to make a good margarita. Most of them are just sugary crap. Oof. I know that, exactly how to make a margarita. Ready? I, okay, go ahead, Nelson. You walk up the street to a place called Meaty Meaty, <laughs> and you ask them for a margarita, and they'll make you one. <laughs> I like Nelson's recipe. Yeah, actually, that's that's our recipe. We walk across <laughs> the street, and we order a pitcher, and then we stumble home. <laughs> but we haven't done that in a while, have we? Nope, it's been a while. There is uh, there is one little secret. Hmm. See this little blue book with the red pen? Mm hmm This book has been in every bar I've been to around the world with me. It has got every drink I learned in it. Wait, hold on. Well, what's it called? Blue book. It's called my fucking bar book. <laughs> it's just a notebook. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant like it was like, like me and everybody I know who's who's worked in like... A machine no. who's worked in like a, a building shop, you know, building stuff. They all have that little black book with all the conversion tables in it and everything like that. I thought it was like a book like that. No, this is my little black book. <laughs> my little black book has donut shops. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. I have a similar book. It's the the 24-hour the donut shops here in LA. <laughs> Yeah, no, like that Which was is partially a responsible for why I, I'm going to the gym. <laughs> that was a constant source of mirth for some of my enforcers at the last packs. Was other guys have a little black book filled with girls' phone numbers. I'm mine is filled with donut shops. <laughs> <laughs> but no, like this is just where I keep every recipe I learn. Like if someone says, "Hey, can you make me this?" and like has a recipe in their head, or like, "Oh, I know this," or like I get a good drink at a bar because the bartender's like, "Oh, fucking here, have one of these." I write it down in the book in my horrible spidery handwriting. <laughs> so no one can steal your recipes. I can barely steal my recipes. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Yeah, like Breeze's, Bourbon Renewals, Au Pairs, B Modified Shirley Temples, fucking tomato daiquiris, popcorns, Purple mm. Martians. Tomato daiquiri? French <laughs> Pussy Ticklers. <laughs> I got fucking everything in here. A couple I've made myself. Yeah. This is this has been my best friend, and it is also not the first one because it's one of those like things where you can put another notebook in here once the previous uh, notebook's done. So I've been filling notebooks for quite some time. Mm. So we I got about. Collect, uh, uh, I also collect old bar books, like other people collect fucking vinyl records. <laughs> so. Uh. So we got about ten minutes left in the show. Um, what kind of drinks would uh, 
Well, let's start with this. What kind of drinks would you guys recommend to uh, to a uh, someone who hasn't, uh, shall we say, imbibed in, uh, in in alcohol before? What are good introductory drinks? Wine. I would try a wine, a red, a lighter red wine, and a beer, maybe an ale. Mm. Yeah, like a. Can we, can we maybe go yeah. a bit into specifics, perhaps, so they don't just go into a store and say, that's a wine? Go go <laughs> to your supermarket, pick a, yell, a yellowtail. Have yes. one of those. If mm. you like the way that tastes, try others of that variety. If you don't like it, try a different yellowtail. Yeah. Okay. Cherba, recommendation from you? Um, huh. Oh, I have it's a very good. important tip. Go on. Oh. Um, so a few, many years ago, well, not very many years ago, when I was in college, um, some friends and I went out to karaoke, and uh, apparently none of my friends had ever had sake before. Oh. And so they got it in the, the, the little cups, as you do, and they thought they were shots. <laughs> <laughs> so my tip to you, Fucker. just because it's in a little cup doesn't mean it's a shot. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> sip, sip it. Doesn't mean uh, it's a <laughs> Literally, all of them, like, shot it back, and I was just like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Uh, uh, my my little bit of advice is that um, is that and this is if you really want to experiment with with alcohol. Um, I would say set aside uh, about um, ten or twenty dollars. I would say even a month. If you want to go if you want to go quicker than that, maybe like ten or twenty dollars a week, and um, go and just. Get something from like go, go to Bevmo and go tr pick pick something you haven't tried before. Um, for me, for me, I I know that I like ciders, so I'll pick up. Oh, hey, look, this company's putting out a is putting out a seasonal cider. Let's let's try that one, or you know, let's try this weird bottle that I've never seen before. And you can build, you can pretty quickly determine. You know what things you like, what things you don't like. Mm. There, there's a cider company called uh, Julian's, and their stuff tastes terrible. Um, there's a, a cider company called uh, uh, Wandering Agus, and their st their ciders taste like how candles. Uh, think, basically, tastes like what a Yankee candle smells like. <laughs> um, that sounds awful. It is awful, yes. A note on crazy uh, bottle art. Yeah. Uh, crazy bottle art is actually... Take a chance on it, because it's either mm. really bad or it's sometimes very good. Yeah. yeah. Also, I mean, I, I second that, yeah. yeah. I would recommend if you go into a place like... Around here we have Total Wine. That's where you get all the wine and all the beer. Mm. People are going to come up to you and ask you if they can help you find anything. Ask them. Yeah. Say, hey, I'm looking for blah, or I'm new to wine. What would you recommend I start with? Mm -hmm. And they're not going to like try and sell you the $100 bottle of wine to start off. They're going to be like, oh, come over here to the $10 and $15 section. Try one yeah. of these or one of these. These are good. And occasionally, stores like that will have uh, yeah. tastings. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a great way to get introduced to new kinds These of... These people literally sell, you know, alcohol for a living, and they want you to come back. So mm -hmm. yeah. they're, they're there to help you. Um, once you've tried a few things, uh, Google the word digestif, um, because there are some interesting flavors that you may really like or really hate. <laughs> uh, and it is basically random, like, what kind of person likes what kind of flavors. Um, I personally am very into Amato, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of a... Oh, what is it? It's not boysenberry. It's, um... I'm really looking it up because I cannot remember. 
Uh, aperitif, not just digestif, not just di- bleh, digestifs, but aperitifs are good too. They're a good way to, you know, good little thing, uh, snackish kind of drink to have before a meal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Aperitif before, digestif after, which oh. it's in the name. Or you'd suspect it, you speak French. Oh. <laughs> Another thing I'd recommend is if you want to drink on the cheap, and this is after mm. you get sort of more experience with what you like and don't like. <laughs> Give box wine a try. Oh yes, yeah. beast bag. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, man. You box can't wine. beat the humble goon bag. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Here's what you do: you take some, you get some box wine, you decant it for like half an hour, and it'll <laughs> taste really good. And the best part, of, the best part about box wine is because you're not introducing air into the bag, the like the wine just comes out. Yeah, keeps forever. It keeps mm-hmm. for a month and a half. Mm. You want to know the trick where you don't have to wait a half an hour? Sure. Uh, go nuts. Blender? You get to, yep, you either stick it in a blender, <laughs> or even better, you get like a bowl or something like that, and then get a stick mixer and just... <laughs> <laughs> just blow bubbles in your wine. Get a straw out. You wine get hacks. Yeah, what if like, you... Can, 30 seconds of aeration with that is the equivalent to 30 minutes of sitting on the fucking countertop doing nothing and not being not being getting you drunk. Yep. But Cherba, what if you bruise the wine? <laughs> what does that drink. even mean? <laughs> we should really talk about how to taste uh, specifically wine and whiskey because there is a, there is a way to do it Properly, there's probably a few ways to do it properly, and there's a uh, a few ways to do it not so properly. Sure, go ahead. Do you um, want to take one or whiskey, Nelson? We'll do one each. I will do uh, whiskey because I remember it best, and it's probably wrong. So you will come <laughs> in later and correct me. Probably only a little. Uh, <laughs> um. So the way I learned, which is, again, probably wrong, uh, is the you have it in something where you can actually, you know, smell it but are not overpowered. Um, and we're not even going to get into different types of glasses because... Oh, God, no. I could do no. a whole show on that. <laughs> um, but you have it... Well, we're doing it. acceptable vices next week. Why not? <laughs> um, you, like... Stir it a little bit. I don't think that actually does anything, but it might. Um, (laughs) uh, And then you release the air out of your mouth so you don't have a a bunch of air, like a mouth air pocket. Uh, And then take a sip and then kind of feel it like go around. And then, don't don't swish it like mouthwash. Don't, yeah, don't do that. Swish it like mouthwash. <laughs> or do, because that would be hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then you swallow it, and then you slowly breathe in. Some people say through your nose, because it kind of makes a light, nice little feeling. Um, but I am told that the lack of air allows you to taste it better without uh, kind of the alcohol burn. Um, but you want that kind of at the end as a little like oof. Yeah, that... I say uh, I say in through your nose and just part your lips slightly and get a little bit of air in that way as well. Mm. Just so you've got mm. air circulating around in your mouth as well. But other than that, yeah, like uh, the only other things I'd add to that are the swirl is basically just to kind of open it up a bit, mm. just uh, move the gases around in the glass. Glasses, ideally, you want something that's a bit bulbous. If you've got nothing else, a red wine glass will do. Mm. It looks weird. But it works. <laughs> I I come from a very uh, traditional Italian family where we use uh, like regular uh, like old fashioned but Tumblers. smaller like yeah, a juice glass. Use, yeah, like a little like juice a little eight ounce juice glass. <laughs> yeah, a little eight ounce. Well, maybe a little yeah. smaller than that, but for wine, uh, mm. none of these fancy you know stem glasses or. Don't use a martini glass, though. That's too open. Oh, my God. <laughs> I that's love... not a glass. If you're swirling, a martini glass isn't a glass. It's a ramp. I love <laughs> all cocktails in cocktail glasses, but the straight 
martini glasses, I cannot deal with. Um, <laughs> you know what the, the best kind of cocktail glass is? Oh. It looks like a martini glass, but it kind of curves up. Oh, a coupe. Your champagne yeah. glass? No, champagne glass is a, no, that's it's, a flute. You don't want that. Yeah, no, it's no, a, no. It's a wider. It, people flat. do use those for, for champagne, yeah. though. You're right. Yeah. It's, 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 it's champagne glass it's before the flute's a, fashion. It's literally called a coupe glass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, well, they're pretty good. Chabonese. Yeah, Chabonese mm -hmm. everything. You'll get used to it. <laughs> it's taking me. It's taken me a while, but. <laughs> uh, Chirbo, what about the uh, what about wines? Good well, tasting tips for wines. Coming from a traditional Australian family, first you take the bag out of the box, uh, <laughs> book it into you, the IV, and be careful about the vein. Then you attach it to the clothesline. Uh, <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, okay, the thing with wine tasting is it seems very complex because people try and get a bit theatrical with it, but it's mm -hmm. very simple. You want to be looking at three things, the look of it, the smell of it, the taste of it. When you see someone hold the glass up to the light on a bit of an angle, they're kind of just looking at the color of it, like how opaque it is, and they're looking at how it sticks to the glass when they move it back into, posi into a usual position. You don't need to worry about that so much because you're not a professional wine taster and it doesn't fucking matter what it looks like as long as it tastes good. <laughs> but smell, kind of important. Like, let it warm in your hand a little bit if it's red wine. If it's white wine, then it's okay cold. But uh, but please don't chill your white wine with ice, you fucking heathens. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my aunt does that, and it makes my skin crawl every time she does it. She does, are you thinking of Laura? Did you see her pour yes. the Sprite in it at, uh, what? Well, when were we at their dinner, oh, yeah. at their house yeah. for dinner last? She put Sprite in it. Oh, my God. That Sprite was in Easter. But, uh, you know what, though? Here's the thing. There's something to be said for people drinking their alcohol the way they fucking want to drink it. Yeah. No swirling, no sniffing, no... I'll get to, yeah. I'll get to that I, I hate whiskey. I hate rum. I hate it. Well, any, any hard liquor, I do not like drinking them straight. I will mix vodka with things. I will mix them with anything, but I do not drink them straight because they're just awful. Mm. Yes, but uh, anyway, much like the yeah. whiskey, you give it a swirl to open it up a bit. Just breathe out for a moment, then small sniff, yeah, a little bit. Just, you know, get rid of that after, give it a few seconds, have another sniff, yeah, fair enough. And if you like the smell of it, which you probably will, because well, let's be honest, wine smells pretty good if it's a mm -hmm. decent wine. Yeah. Just uh, have a taste. Don't gulp it. Just have a bit, a decent bit of a sip. Enough to coat your tongue and everything else. Just like, mm, yeah, you know, that feels good. Um, Just let it roll around in your mouth a bit and then swallow it. Don't spit it out because what are you, a fucking animal? <laughs> uh, I have a, a funny wine story when, we're, when you're done. And uh, basically once all that's done, if it tastes good, uh, yeah, good times. <laughs> grab the bottle. <laughs> yeah, grab a bottle and fucking drink straight from that. I mean, if my 80-year-old grandmother doesn't need glasses, neither do I. <laughs> Uh, Actually, got, no, that uh, used to be my old party trick. Was <laughs> was my old party trick was I'd open a party by like fucking cranking the top of a bottle of champagne with my thumb, just like bang, and then fucking just necking a bottle of champagne. <laughs> <laughs> just cheap yellowtail swill, but oh fuck. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Did you ever see that? Uh, did I ever send you that video of that guy who who necked the bottle of uh, Jack Daniels? <laughs> Oh shit! Wow. Do you Jack remember? Daniels tastes like fucking sadness in a bottle. I tell you what, go. I tell you what, though, it makes a fantastic barbecue based. Oh yeah. yeah. See, so here's good. the thing: every alcohol, no matter how good or bad, has fucking value. Someone mm -hmm. likes it somewhere, and it has some sort of purpose behind a bar. Like Jack Daniels, if you're drinking it neat, you. I, well, that's your taste, but I don't agree with it, and you're probably wrong. I once, <laughs> I once went to a fancy, fancy party with like fancy French professors, like they taught at the Sorbonne, and at the end of the party, uh, at the end of the like the dinner thing, they were like, "Oh, we don't have, we're low on alcohol, so 
here are some very exquisitely crafted whiskey glasses and Jim Bean. <laughs> oh, <fuck>. oh, man. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, like, freaking, it still has its place in mixed drinks because it's actually a surprisingly good mixer because it doesn't have any sort of seriously distinct flavor of its own to get overwhelmed or to overwhelm anything else while still retaining that same taste of that type of liquor. It's like Tim Payne. Yes. <laughs> but here's the important thing. Don't hang shit on people for drinking what they fucking like. Yeah. Don't let people hang shit on you for drinking what you fucking like. Drink whatever you like. Mm. Oh, well, within a reasonable amount. We're not encouraging over yeah. here. <laughs> no, no, please. <laughs> but still, like, or, you know, don't break the law or anything. But other than that, yeah. within the bounds of good taste and the law... Drink whatever you like, however you like, whenever you like. It doesn't fucking mm. matter. Mm-hmm. Yep. It's your fucking taste buds that you have control over and are fucking yeah. servicing. Not all these other fucks who are sitting around judging you because you got this fucking fruity thing that comes in a fish bowl with 48 <laughs> fucking umbrellas and a curly straw. If it yeah, tastes you always good make you, fun of... you fucking drink it. <laughs> and you know what? If you're listening and you are of, and you're sitting there thinking to yourself... Well, yes, of course, and these are all wonderful tips. But some drinks are just garbage, and people are garbage for drinking them. It's I'll make okay. Those jokes. It's okay I'll make those jokes. to not like things, but don't <laughs> be a dick about it. No, yeah. no. Remember if when we you like about... Bud Light strawberry margaritas? You are uh, wrong, and you should no. feel bad. You know, George? remember when I talked about banker bars? No. <laughs> Guess where I don't go? I don't go to banker bars. I let them live in their bridge and tunnel, gross uh, uh, Jägermeister pounding, uh, uh, Red Bull infused delirium, and I go off and do my fruity cocktails and my like, uh, I don't know, drinking a single beer after getting out of work and then being like, whoa, I am tipsy, I should go to bed. (laughs) Or eat something. <laughs> yeah. I'd like, you know... Yeah. No, if you like Bud Light Lime Maritas, you're just wrong. I'm sorry. Really, the biggest tip I can give when it comes to alcohol is be fucking courageous. And I don't mean four beers in. Talk to that no. girl that two beers ago over by the, over there that you thought was a mutant. Like, not that kind <laughs> of courageous, not Dutch courage. But just have some a bit of spine and a bit of adventurousness to go yeah. out and try different things. You never know, mm. man. You might like mm. all sorts of different shit. You'd never find out if you never tried it. And you know what? Even if you're hesitant about being adventurous the first time, once you try something new once, it's a lot easier to go out and try other new things. Mm. Because, yeah, because either... You're, you're drunk. Well, no. <laughs> 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 what I mean is that once you open up to new flavors once, you'll, you'll find out that exploring new tastes isn't scary. For whatever reason, people think exploring new tastes is scary. Personally, I'd love to try, you know, something I've never tried before. Yeah, like, if you buy a drink and you hate it, you can't stand it, you know what you've lost? Like, ten bucks, if at most. You, but you, well, what you've gained oh. is now you know never to have that again. There you go. Because knowledge is power. <laughs> oh yeah, and if and if you're going to do a, a shot of anything higher than uh, 80 proof, sit down or have like a place where you can sit down. A fainting couch. Yeah, have a have a have a have a spotter. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> oh. Ah. And uh, on that note, thank you guys. This has been a fantastic show. I'd say this is, for, for a topic that I thought was going to be kind of a floof, this has actually been kind of a very good show. Uh, well, yeah, so, dude, I could literally teach a class on this, man. I mean, I, well, I do, sat, do you want to do you, do you talk more about alcohol next week? Because we do have another episode of Acceptable Vices to do. We can, but let's focus more on Dumbo's stories next week and things like yeah. that, because we never got to the super fun parts of Dumbo's stories. Yeah, we'll Dumbo's stories are great. We'll we'll try and corral Pete in, because he's a maniac. Oh, <laughs> wow, yeah. Pete would be great. Yeah. yeah. All right, but, so... Uh, yeah. um, Get on to that on next that, week. Yeah. On that note, we're going to be... Uh, we'll probably be talking about Dumbo's stories uh, 
Next week's going to be acceptable, I think, because we had two episodes of Friday Night Party Line in a row. But in the meantime, thank you to George, Chris, Nelson, Cherba, and you will hear from us next week on Acceptable Vices. Good night, everybody. Good night. Uh,